Good evening and welcome to the February 27, 2023 Council meeting. Members of the public have been provided with the following methods to watch and or participate in the open meeting. First, attend in person at the Township office. Second, watch the live stream by accessing the meeting on the Township YouTube page. Third, attend electronically to observe the meeting or to speak to an item on the agenda by registering with the clerk's clerk division in advance. And finally, submit written comments to the clerk's division that have been provided to the mayor and council and will form part of the public record. I'd like to call the meeting to order, please, and can I have the agenda, please? Uh, approval of the agenda. Myself, by Councilor Wilms, that council adopts February 27, 2023 council meeting agenda as presented. Following amendment, move draft meeting minutes under item 8.2. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. I would now like to do the Indigenous acknowledgement. We acknowledge that the land on which we gather today is the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee and is now the Inuitian. We acknowledge the enduring presence of the Indigenous people with whom we share this land today, their achievements and their contributions to our community. We offer this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation between Indigenous and non Indigenous peoples of Canada. And as we pause to reflect, let us remember or learn what has happened in the past. Take those lessons with us as we walk with our indigenous people, moving towards a better communication and working together for the good of us all. We pause for a moment of silence. Thank you. Are there any difficulties or interest to bring up general nature thereof? Seeing none, there's no presentations. We have a delegation. Uh, Lynn Krieger of the Air Horticultural Society. Welcome, Lynn. Cynthia, have you got Lynn there? She is. Thank you. Go ahead, Lynn. Okay, ready to go? Yeah. Good evening. Yes, Sorry. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight, especially on this snowy night, and to share the events of the North Dumfries Garden Club with you uh, for 2022. First of all, I'd like to introduce myself to Alita. Wilms and Scott Tilly. I don't believe that I have met either of you at this point, but hopefully our paths will cross in the near future. Welcome to the rest of the council. I think you know me and uh, I think I know most of you. First of all, I want to um, tell you a little bit about um, the reason for two names. Um, those of you that have heard this talked before probably know that. Um, in 1920, the Air Horticultural Society was formed and that is, it, is its legal name. Um, about seven or eight years ago, the Ontario Horticultural Association suggested that we might want to have what they call the soft name. So we decided we would take them up on that and we changed our name to the North Dumfries Garden Club. Now, because the legal name is Air Horticultural Society in anything uh, dealing with the bank, for instance, or um, other societies, um, we need to use that name as well as our North Dumfries Garden Club. The reason we changed our name to the North Dumfries Garden Club was First of all, it's more inclusive, which we were concerned about. It's more inviting and it's less intimidating. I have to admit that when I first joined the club myself, I thought, wow, horticultural, that sounds like a group of people who know a heck of a lot about gardening and I didn't know much at all. But I have found that not to be true. And, and I think the term garden club uh, makes it a little more um, inviting to people. Okay, next slide. Yeah. 
the, I hope you know that the year 2022 was the year of the garden. And this was uh, proposed by um, the Ontario Horticultural Society, which um, covers right across Canada. Or on, well, the Ontario one obviously uh, deals with our, our own province. The um, purpose of the year of the garden was to celebrate the 100th anniversary of horticultural sector across Canada. And it's interesting to know that we are the first country in the world to celebrate the horticultural sector. Um, in the year of the, the uh, garden, we were, we were invited to try and uh, create more awareness of garden, um, to make people more aware of the value of gardening. I think most people probably think of it as uh, good exercise, um, perhaps a mental, um, in that it, I think it improves your, your mental outlook on life. Um, there's nothing more exciting than seeing those seeds become flowers and and the success of, of uh, growing those. But there's also other ways that it helps, social, environmental, uh, cultural, to name a few, a few. One of the things that they suggested was that we go with a theme color and the color that was selected was red. And so we tried to encourage people in town to uh, plant red last year and we try to make use of it ourselves. The OHA usually picks a color each year and the, the color for this year is to be purple. You don't have to pick the color or, or go with the color if you don't want to, but it's just a, a process that they have uh, chosen to go with. Okay, the other thing that we did do to try and incre increase our awareness was we put a lot more uh, um, articles in the air news and also um, more ads about um, our program and things that people could get involved in. And we um, now have a website and we uh, also have a, um, other social media um, broadcasting our, our um, activities. Okay, next slide. Okay, some of the ways that we um, try to um, improve or to expand on our um, awareness or our, um, no, uh, yeah, our awareness in town, first of all, is our club meetings. And there are eight meetings in a year. People throughout town and, and uh, the um, township are invited to those meetings. You can come to any one that you wish. Um, and just a couple of examples here on the screen. The one in the middle was a meeting that we invited a group from Paris, Ontario. Some of you may be familiar with the raw carrot soup enterprises. This group um, works with either a church or a nonprofit group uh, to create meaningful employment for people with disabilities or mental illnesses. And the idea is that it gave these people a purpose in life uh, and it made their um, well being much improved. They make a soup. And you can see three of them there. They're now making seven different soups. And these soups are, are sold in, well, they sell them um, themselves, but they also sell them in stores such as Sobeys carries them. I believe, I believe Foodland has them. And they're in the frozen food section. They also, the people working there are being paid. They do work with a volunteer, which helps them to learn how to make a soup and, and the proper techniques and um, such. Um, these, these people have now found some friends and um, definitely have learned some life skills. There was one interesting example that the one young girl that was working there 
had received her first paycheck. And um, the one of the women that works there had asked her what she did with her money. And she said, well, she had some kittens. So she bought them all new toys. And she also gave some money to her mother. So I thought it was interesting that, that her choice and the fact that she was so proud of having some money of her own in her own pocket. The uh, meeting on the left corner is our Christmas uh, celebration. And um, one of the things that we encourage people to do at the Christmas celebration was to bring a dish for our potluck dinner that was made from vegetables or fruit that they had grown in their own garden. Some were um, easily, um, or found it easy to do that. Some of us that aren't vegetable gardeners um, weren't so, so uh, willing to follow that line. On the picture on the right hand side, uh, you'll see our garden hero. This was something else that was introduced during the year of the garden. Uh, clubs were invited to pick a member that they thought represented um, what we, we felt was the, a good garden hero. And in the middle of that picture is Jean Rickard. I think some, many of you probably know Jean. The reason we selected Jean was that she shows leadership skills. She was president for a number of years. She is very good at workshops, working one-on-one -on -one with people. <laughs> One example is the um, snowflakes that you've seen. Uh, they're made out of coat hangers and they're on the side of our uh, little shed in uh, Greenwood Park. Uh, she's also organized bus and garden tours. Um, she has a great liaison with, with people and, and certainly with the township. And she... <laughs> We felt that because she's so outgoing and she invites people to our meetings and has helped to increase our, our population as well, that she was really uh, deserving of, uh, of having this uh, award. And the other people, the other people in the um, picture are, well, myself and Bob Marshall, who many of you also know. Okay, moving on. Okay, we also did a number of events um, in the year of 2022. On the left-hand side, there was a group of people, um, members and non-members, who uh, chose to make a um, evergreen swag, something that they could hang on the wall or on their doors. And uh, that was done out of time from our, our meetings. So. It was held on a, another night, and uh, in this case, it was all women that took them up on this, but uh, you can see them there showing off their swags. In the center picture, we went, went on a tour of um, a greenhouse, Alder, Aldershot greenhouse, which is near Dundas. You might ask why we went that far afield. The gentleman standing in our front with his back to us is a member of our club, lives here in Air, and he works at the Aldershot Greenhouse. So he invited us to go and see um, what went on in a greenhouse and the workings there. It was most interesting, um, quite overwhelming, the size of, the, of this particular greenhouse and the amount of work and knowledge that goes into um, getting those plants into the stores and the uh, garden um, centers is, is really quite overwhelming. Um, Jacob goes overseas several times a year, um, learning new techniques, um, being introduced to new plants and learning things that he can bring here. Um, and Lynn, Lynn, yes, Lynn, um, you're out of time, so if you want to just wrap it up, please. Oh, my Thank goodness, you. okay. <laughs> um, well, I just want to say uh, that we appreciate the work that we're doing uh, with the township and the help that they are offering us. And uh, we hope that a number of you will come to um, 
a meeting. You don't have to come to all of them, but if you have a chance and see something that looks interesting, it is advertised in the Air News and, and uh, on Facebook. And um, you're certainly um, um, invited to um, join our club if you wish. And there's lots of advantages to that. Thank you very much. Yeah, I want to thank you and your group. You do an amazing job. We're really pleased that uh, for all the work you do. And the pictures were amazing. I'd love to have made a sway. Are there any other comments, classes? Seeing none, can I have the motion, please? Move on myself, uh, second by Councilor Tilly, that the delegation received from Lake Creedon with the Air Horticultural Society North Dumfries Garden Club regarding an annual update the council be received with thanks. All those in favor? Councilwoman, did you go on the scavenger hunt? No, I didn't. Oh, you're quite fine. Thank you, Nick. Have a great night. Okay, thanks very much. Next, we have Jeff Stanger with the London Federation of Agriculture regarding the census. Jeff Stanger. Hi, thank you very much for that uh, greeting, Your Worship. Um, what a night. Certainly, it's looks like Canada, snowy and crazy out tonight, but here we are. And just delighted, I am delighted to be here on behalf of the Federation of Agriculture to bring you the latest, not the latest, but census data for the Waterloo region. Now, before I start, first of all, congratulations to councillors on their election or re-election to council. It's an important job and uh, recognition of all the work that staff do to make it all work, to get the places down where they should be and up there and around and all that stuff that staff do. So thanks to staff for what they do. So um, I'd invite you to have a look at the uh, first document, if you could, it's called Census Bulletin 2016. So this is a really cool document. This is put out by the Region of Waterloo, and they very kindly put together a lot of info on the four pages and uh, in a nice infographic style. And I'm looking forward to just the backstory here is, you know what, this is one cycle late, this census. Uh, the, 20, the 2020 census has been out, but the region, unfortunately, had not had a chance to do that as per usual. But I understand that that is going to be done this year, so looking forward to that. And if I don't say bad words, maybe you'll invite me back and I'll bring that census data. <laughs> so with that, let's look at the first page there. And uh, you can identify our local municipality here in North Dumfries and the total number of farms over the region. And uh, in 2016, 108 farms. In the region where I do, in 2016, it was 1,374 farms. In the province, 49,000. In the country, 193,000. So um, it's nice, our, our friends and our, our fellow uh, citizens of the region who live in town are always quite impressed with the fact that there are farms within their jurisdictions, but it does show that you know we're really bond together country and, and uh, city in the region where I do. Um, there's, I can, I'll update the, the latest, we have a little bit of 2020 information I'll pass along, but I'll get there, when we get there, I'll mention it. Okay, let's switch to number, page number two, please, on this four page document. Um, at the top there in the right hand corner is a little guy with a pitchfork and it says the average age of farm operators in the region of Waterloo was 49.5 in the province is 55.3. So you know what that indicates? There's, there's growth in the industry, there's, there's new people coming along, new ideas, new businesses. So. There's a lot to be said that agriculture is doing pretty good in the region. Um, some other odds and ends there that you can have time to look over. One beside the farms, uh, we're certainly um, about 100 acres. In, in Canada, it's, it's more than seven or 800 acres, but that's because there's some really large operations in the West. Uh, let's go to page number three. What kind of farms do we have in the Waterloo region? So we're really good at cattle farming, livestock. Uh, there's a whole bunch more farms that are growing vegetables and fruits and so on because uh, we're lucky to be close to a big city and people are looking for fresh strawberries and looking for fresh tomatoes and that sort of things. Um, so you can look through all those numbers. It's quite, it, 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 it's, it's, it's interesting stuff. Um, I always enjoy looking at this to see where numbers are going, see what trends are. It's the best I can do with just sitting in my, my home looking through the numbers quickly. Uh, in 2016, there was 45 farms that did sell organic products, and one in 10 farms in the region in 2016 were using renewable energy 
had renewable energy systems on their farm. And that trend continues. Now let's have a quick look at the last page. How much business is that? So in 2016, there were um, in the North Gulf East, well, I'll do the whole region, $563 million worth of gross farm receipts and expenses of $390 million. So it's a fair bit of uh, business. Um, so the long game here I want to bring to your attention is agriculture is a really important part business-wise and for many reasons, the reason Waterloo. And uh, my ask of you tonight, if anything, would be that you would consider at the even at the, at the township or, or the seven municipalities in the region plus the, the regional government that in fact, once the term, uh, staff look at those numbers and just draw some trends and, and uh, you know, whether we need to do something different or not, that's debatable, but let's get the, let's get the data in, in place so we can talk about agriculture is how it can do all the things that people want, whether it's food or environmental issues. And agriculture can also produce, produce more economic activity in the region of Waterloo. So uh, before I get too far ahead of myself, uh, as I mentioned, the, the final page here on a separate document, the one page of local snapshot, this guy here is something that our Federation of Agriculture put together, a provincial association, and it's uh, just a one page real quick on the latest census because they have access to those numbers that the region doesn't but haven't had time to do yet. So those 1,300 farms are now 1,409 farms. So there's an increase in the total number of farms that were in the region. You'll find there's a little nuance to this. Our numbers go up and down. You find most of the towns with dump trees went down. There's a kind of reverse kind of congratulations in there. Here's why. Most agriculture jurisdictions in, the prov in, in Canada have noticeably dropped in the number of farms. So perversely, we're ahead, we're ahead of the pack because our numbers are steady. So whether intentionally or inadvertently because of the various planning laws, we're doing a good job with agriculture in the region, one could argue. But it doesn't change the fact that it would be good to have those numbers, uh, some kind of a basic matrix of the five or six latest on you know, half a dozen parameters that we agree would be important. And I think we could you know, dig into this a bit further if we really want to really promote even more agriculture, even more business activity. So just to finish this off um, on this one pager. Um, so it's $652 million in farm cash receipts. 22% uh, of those farms are generating renewable energy, solar, wind, and of course, bioreactors now where they can take, uh, we can create uh, natural gas, methane gas, and either burn it on site for making power or insert it back into the pipelines. So. Interesting, the different things on the farm. It's not just food and fiber anymore. 28% of the farm operators are female now, and 43% of the farms are small farms, less than $100,000. And this is certainly where a lot of new farms are coming up. These folks, they are finding those small niche markets that we're so lucky to have in the region where we're doing. Here's why we've got a half a million people, and there's somebody out there who wants that product you really like or you're really good at doing. You know, maybe it's growing garlic or something, you just, you just pick it. So there's, it seems to be there's an opportunity of new farms on that small, almost back to the family farm type stuff. And all farms are family farms, but some are, as you can be well aware, really big operators, but this is a nice beginning for people, perhaps. Of course, if we do a census data, maybe we can find out these things, that'd be quite delightful. <laughs> so with that folks, that's the, I can sort of pretty much up my presentation. Although uh, I just want to bring your attention to this document here, you have a copy of it. Now, you know, I know you all, are busy uh, going about the business of the township and you're reading reports, looking at minutes and so on. And of course, end of the day, I know you're just gonna to wanna to do some recreational reading. Well, I would suggest that this is probably a document you wanna have a look at. And we're just delighted to have this one. Right on the front page, it says, we're help, we wanna help you make informed choices with straight answers on food security, climate change, animal welfare, food safety, and lots of other things. Also the lovely infographic style, and uh, just to late, if you have a moment to look through that, there's lots of stuff in there. There's probably questions you've had about agriculture, things you didn't know. And uh, this all provides a good uh, base moving forward because in the, this term or other terms, you will be deciding issues about agriculture. And we just really be delighted if, if, if looking at these census data and, and articles like this would be part of that. So with that, thank you very much for your for having the time here to talk to you. and. Uh, um, with that, uh, good luck in the next four years. Lots going on. Thank you again. Thank you, Jim. Councillors, any questions? 
Seeing none, can I have a motion to move? Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Osner, that the delegation received from Jeff Steger from the Waterloo Federation of Agriculture re regarding the census of agriculture be received with thanks. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Mary Jane Patterson and Patrick Kilbride for uh, the Wheat Green Solutions. Go ahead, folks. Mark. Let me do that with Vice President Mark. Uh, thanks very much. Um, I'm Patrick Gilbride. I'm the Associate Director here at REEC. Uh, good evening, Mayor Foxton and, and councillors. Uh, and again, I'd echo that. Congratulations on your elections. And I, again, uh, thank you to uh, staff and attendance as well. Um, we, uh, we're excited to be here to present our, our latest impact report. Um, we we're, we we're hoping to attend in person, but uh, we appreciate the flexibility to allow us to attend remotely given the, the weather. We're hunkered down in our... Uh, <laughs> demonstration house for sustainable living here in Kitchener. It's about a five minute walk for each of Mary Jane and I, but on a normal day, it was about twice that uh, tonight. Uh, so uh, if you could move to the next slide, please. At Reaping Solutions, we recognize the pressing challenge that climate change poses in the coming years. We know that we need the community as a whole to take action. So we've set a milestone, which we hope represents a much larger transformation in the community. That goal is by 2030, people impacted by Reap Green Solutions will have taken 10,000 meaningful actions to collectively shift our community to a resilient, low carbon future. Next slide. And I'm happy to report that we're almost a third of the way towards meeting our 2030 goal. These actions represent tangible steps that people in our community have taken on their sustainability journeys. In the remaining slides, we'll outline some of these meaningful actions in more detail. Next slide, please. Home energy evaluations are a great example of this. You can see on the slide that 465 homeowners had home energy evaluations last year, taking advantage of the new Greener Homes Initiative from the federal government. 140 of those have already completed their upgrades based on our recommendations and have received incentives to help them cover the cost. These are meaningful actions that represent genuine greenhouse gas reductions. We're also very pleased to report growth in energy evaluations and completed retrofits in North Humphreys as compared to our previous impact report. Several homeowners have already completed their retrofits which we've calculated will result in over three tons of carbon reductions year over year. This increase in participation and action can be attributed to the Federal Greener Homes Program, which provided incentives for all homes, not just natural gas heated homes. Next slide. We want to continue to encourage home energy retrofits going forward. Last year, we told council that we were working on providing wraparound supports for home energy evaluations. This past year, we concluded the design of what that would look like, including loans for home upgrades. This is action 3.1.9 of Transform WR, which Mary Jane will touch on later on in the presentation. An important outcome of that process is the report you see on the right-hand side of the slide about equity in home energy loan programs. We have shared this report with a number of other municipalities in Canada who've been asking about it because we are the first to look specifically at equity in these financing programs. Next slide, please. Our Healthy Yards and Neighborhoods programs are an important resource to adapt to climate change. We've developed a suite of online tools that show people how to naturalize their yards, which are the building blocks to climate resilient neighborhoods. And just as a side note, I was really happy to hear the presentation from the North Dumfries Garden Club. Uh, a couple of our my colleagues are uh, presenting to the North Dumfries Garden Club uh, as we speak tonight. So 
uh, we're happy to uh, to make that connection and uh, relationship going forward. We also offer some full service offerings uh, in other cities, which include backyard tree planting, uh, rain gardens, and our bloom and box uh, spring uh, fall spring sale and our fall shrub fundraisers, which provide harder to find native plants that thrive in our climate. I'll now pass it over to Mary Jane to uh, talk about some of our other things. Hi, everybody. I'm really glad to be with you all here tonight. And I'm going to say a little bit about uh, the way in the door for people for climate action. Oh, could we have the next slide, please? So I'm talking about community engagement here, and you can see many people tuned into our webinars and participated in the Zero Waste Challenge, and that we have uh, programming for students now through uh, Youth Cutting Carbon. We see each of these as a kind of easy entry point for people into taking climate action. And so we're really pleased to have these kinds of things. They're not uh, specifically funded, neither is the repost that we're in, but core funding from our core partners um, helps make this possible. On the workshop side, we moved online during the pandemic and we're able to accommodate many more people. Um, some of the most popular ones have been about gardening and um, topics like rain gardens and healthy yards. These really struck a chord with people during COVID. Now, as we move out of the pandemic, we're gonna keep a mixture of both in-person and online so that we can try to make it accessible no matter what type of experience people want as their way in the door. Next slide, please. As you may be aware, Reap Green Solutions and our colleagues at Sustainable Waterloo Region co-lead the climate action strategy for our community. Our long-term climate action plan, Transform WR, was endorsed by council in 2021. And it's our guiding light now. We wanted you all to have this at your fingertips. So you're going to soon be receiving your own copy as a reference. No one else gets this. It's online for everybody else, but we made a hard copy for all of the councillors in the region so that you can have it at your fingertips. And we're just working now on connecting with staff to drop them off for you. I refer to this almost every day. We also want to offer an introduction to Transform WR um, just to help you get your bearings with it. So we're working with the townships to offer an education session for councillors and key staff. So that's an open invitation to you. You'll be, your staff will be hearing from uh, our team. We'd be happy to come to North Dumfries for this. Um, so we're just reaching out now to set that kind of thing up, if you would like. On the slide, you see our three sector committees, and they did great work this past year working on equity on cycling trails in the cities and helping to demystify heat pumps for residential and commercial buildings. And now we're working towards our 2020 inventory report, and we're talking right now to the clerks of all the municipalities to set up a time when we can share those with you. Next slide, please. Here's a breakdown of our expenses by program, and it gives you a sense of the diversity of programs that we offer and the different ways that people can take action in their own lives. And I think you, you can kind of see that it breaks down almost equally in terms of mitigation, climate change mitigation, which is helping to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and climate adaptation through things like our Healthy Yards programs that Patrick was talking about, which reduce flooding, increase tree canopy, and support pollinators. Next slide, please. Here's how our revenue breaks down. And you'll see that about half of our revenue, 49%, you can see that represented by the two big triangles on the left side of the graph. Um, half our revenue comes through contract work and client fees. We really strive to have a diversity of revenue sources to not just be reliant on grants and those help keep us on an even keel. Next slide, please. We've got a couple of things to share with you that we are looking ahead to. One is that we put together a coalition of a number of different organizations in Waterloo Region that work on tree planting and tree stewardship. And we're really happy to work with Rare Char Charitable Research Reserve as part of that collaboration 
Together, we were successful in receiving a Two Billion Trees grant. I always want to say $2 billion, but it isn't. But it's a Two Billion Trees grant. That's a program from the federal government to help us create our own tree nursery and share those trees with local native seeds with all these partners that do programs um, in the community on trees. So more to come on that as we get started on this project. And on the right-hand side, we've been looking into the issue of energy poverty in Waterloo Region and the role that it plays in affordable housing. If you wanna know more right away, you can have a look at the blog on our website on this topic. There's a lot more to understand and to do. Last slide, please. Uh, we wanna close by saying a very big thank you to the Township of North Dumfries and to you, Mayor Foxton, as a member of Regional Council, um, you're part of providing core funding for REAP through the region of Waterloo and that core funding makes all of this possible. So thank you very much. Um, and thank you, North Dumfries Council. We uh, appreciate the time to talk to you and we wanna say our doors open anytime you wanna talk sustainability. We're ready. Thank you, Mary Jane and uh, Patrick. Mary Jane, how did the zero waste challenge go? Oh, and we had a kind of neat uh, year this past year. More participants, more pets. Love it when the pets step up. And um, making more of a link to the circular economy, which is part of what's in uh, Transform. So that was kind of cool. Thanks, Rob. So the zero waste challenge, I, I took it two years ago, was it? Um, I think so is where you have to, uh, was it a week long? You can do a week or you can do a month? You can, yeah, you can right. do seven days or, or 30 days. And so what you have to do is try and get all your waste into a mason jar. It was quite an interesting challenge. Did you ever find out if the Lysol wipes were waste or not? I'm pretty sure they are. I'm That's pretty right. sure. Yeah. It's a, so some of what you learn is kind of disappointing when you participate and you yes, realize yes. what can and can't Thank be recycled. And I love the tree idea. Yeah, I think it's sweet. I, you know, um, when I bought my first house in there, when my husband actually was a second, um, it was, there was Arbor Day in May. And I didn't know who ran it, but you could buy eight trees for $10. And we ended up buying... I think it was 70 trees. They were little evergreens, and now they completely surround our property. You can't see our property. But it was a huge deal, and it was great. I don't do it anymore. I don't know who headed it up. There's That's fantastic. But uh, maybe it's something to think about. I would in May selling trees. Um, and also, the GRC, I think, is committed to 200,000 trees this year as well, and they also yeah. sell trees. But um, yeah. thank you for all you do. And, We'll get there, hopefully. Got to think good thoughts. Thank you for all you do. Any other questions, Councillors? Any Councillors want to take the zero waste challenge? Get a hold of me. I'll get you a hold of Mary Jane. So I'll give you a zero. I'll give you a mason jar. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing to try. Oh, Lee, I think you really should. And I think Scott should too. Actually, all of you should. It's interesting. Even Irene. <laughs> Thanks a lot. And uh, can I have the motion, please? Moved by myself, seconded by Council Roman, that the delegation received from Mary Jane Peterson and Patrick Gilbride with Reap Green Solutions regarding the 2021-2022 impact report be received with thanks. All those in favor. That's scary. Thank you. Thank bye you, bye everybody. all. Thank you. Okay. Next up is the poll reports. Um, can I have the motion, please? Correct. Myself, so by Council Tilly, that Council adopt the following recommendation that presented by Committee of the Whole, dated February 13, 2023. AP Report 02-2023 Proposed Zoning Bylaw Amendment 197-211 from the Street Air, file number ZC-0521. That P Report number 02-2023 be received. And that bylaw number 3386-23 being a bylaw to further amend General Zoning Bylaw 689-83. Locate the redevelopment of 197-211 from the Street 
for a future condom development for 41 townhouse dwelling units be enacted, and that in accordance with section 34, subsection 17 of the Planning Act, Council does not believe that further notice or the convening of an additional public hearing is required. And B, F3 report number 02 2023 Fire Department Incident Response Summary, January 2023. That FD report 02 2023 be received for purposes of information. Thank you. All those in favor? That's Carrie. Thank you. And now we're down to 9.1. Council Austin, please. Uh, Move by myself, second by Councilor Tilly, that uh, rec report number 04 2023 be received and that staff be authorized to contract for the design, supply, and install of a play structure targeted at the 5 to 12 age floor. Option B attached to this report at Branchton Park, located at 30 Mary Street, purchased through Source Well. Uh, the units will bring the program to BCI Burke Park of Water Inc. in the amount of $54,119.69 plus HST. Let the mayor and clerk be authorized to execute any necessary documents to, facil to facilitate the completion of this project. All those in favor. Carrie, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Next, we have communications. Is there any item anybody would like to touch on the communications? Is the I don't know what number it was on page ninety four. I was going to ask about the cannabis one. Uh, an interesting resolution. I don't know if our council wanted to back it or not. That was yeah. from the county of Huron. It's 11.1.6. Uh, so I wanted to uh, discuss 11.1.8. Right. Um, I don't know. So the cannabis one was about um, orders and asking the government if they could have more <coughs> um, control over the orders of uh, people are doing a number of plants under net or whatever other means and uh, the orders from these places are causing a problem. And I just, we're looking at that and uh, maybe we'll have staff come back and, and do a little report on that and see how we can down the road. Thank you. 11.1.8 um, correspondence received from Jared Bellamy regarding the pump track project. And I do have a sheet for some. <coughs> so um, there's two options. Uh, one is that a motion to reconsider a council decision. Okay, go ahead, Council Ross. Thank you. Um, basically, I was going to ask Council if we could uh, revisit this decision um, and if we could bring this back to discussion and uh, I, I would like to be involved in this, these discussions as I was last time. Thank you. Now I will need that. Um, a motion to reconsider the council decision uh, to be brought forward by a member of council to the next regular council meeting. Any member of council can advise the clerk to have this item added to the March 27th agenda. At the March 27th meeting, at least two thirds of the members of council, that means four out of five members, must vote in favor to reconsider the decision. Um, no delegations may speak to a motion to reconsider. Motion to reconsider cannot be reconsidered a second time. No motion is required. Members of council to advise the clerk to of notice to reconsider and to be added to March 27th agenda. And that was option one. Option two is to forego the council's procedural bylaw. Council can suspend their rules and reconsider the council decision at tonight's meeting. To do so, 
council must waive your procedural bylaw and at least two thirds of members of council, that's four out of five, must vote in favor of the motion and a draft motion to waive procedural bylaw. It states that council suspends the rules of the procedural bylaw to reconsider the following decision made by council at their meeting held on January 26, 2023. Number one, that FIN record number 02 2023 BBC. Number two, and that council adopt in principle the projects in the 10 year capital forecast 2023 to 2032 to inform the township of North Dunkley's future financial capital budgets and ongoing planning and financial analysis with the following amendment. Number one, Move the pump track with asphalt surface construction and design in the amount of 5856000 5, from 2025 to 2027. And that council directs staff to prepare a report outlining strategies related to the feasibility of preserving the Nip Vale Bridge rehabilitation for off-road trail development to include steps for design timelines, phasing strategies, cost maintenance, and funding methods. So, which option do we want to go with? Does anyone have any comments? So, what council is asking for is to reopen the discussion on the contract and to do so um, in a tax tenure capital. And uh, one moment. So, to do so, it needs uh, four to five to vote in favor to do so. Council Lawson. Thank you. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, basically, I'm asking it to be reopened, uh, council. Yeah. If council agrees, uh, whether we do it tonight or at the next council meeting, whatever uh, council feels appropriate, if they decide to to bring that forward. All right. So, so at this point, uh, council Woman. Madam Mayor, I guess I'm a little confused by um, Councilor Austin's request. The um, tenure capital forecast is, is, as we've said many times, a fluid document. So. When we decided the last meeting, Councilor Officer was actually at the meeting. Uh, if he's incorrect, saying he wasn't, he was at the meeting. Uh, he left partway through. Yeah, that was not the case. And I heard before I should be. Um, so actually, what we did was we moved to 27, but that doesn't preclude Mr. Bellamy from putting together a pump track committee. It doesn't stop him from setting up an MOU. It doesn't stop him from, from moving forward with fundraising. What should happen, I think, is that those things should happen now. And then in August, this comes back to council. If he could come to us at that time and say, hey, I've got the MOU in place, I've got my committee in place, I've got fundraising lined up, ready to go, then council can very easily move back to 25 or 26 or, or whatever year makes sense. The fact that it's still in the tenure capital forecast is a positive thing. I support this project. I told Mr. Dung I support this project, but we need to nail down location. Um, and the other thing is, in his letter, he said that, um, that uh, Schmidt Park was the only location. And in the staff report, both the contract has said that we had to look at all options. So I, I want to make sure that's clear. We look at all options. The project has not been sidetracked or sidelined. It's just we pushed back slightly in order for things to get lined up. So I think it's time for Mr. Bellamy to get things lined up and we can revisit this in August. I, there's no need to do this now. See, I'm like, Mary, did you have your picture paper there? No, okay. Councilor Russell, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I agree with part of what Councillor Roller said. That, um, the uh, discussion was brought up, and then Councillor Rollerman um, requested that we stop talking about that and not go with the SAR. After I had left, uh, approximately an hour and a half later, it was voted on to um, to not move ahead with the pump track and move it to 2027. My concern with that is. Um, uh, Mr. Bellamy and his group are moving forward with getting their uh, ducks in a row and getting this all organized and in full stream and full flow, which has been going for almost a year now, and there's never been any discussion about the fact that uh, this isn't the right location. Uh, Councilor Rollman was on the uh, state, uh, the, the pump track committee and never expressed, expressed any uh, displeasure of the location. Um, their group is moving forward with doing everything they need to do, and at the very last minute, at the very last minute, this has happened before, this has stopped, and they have been stopped in their track. Um, 
I, I think that reflects badly on the council's decision when we move forward with a project for eight months and then at the last minute decide, yeah, no, we're not going to do it. We're going we're gonna to push them off two years. When the group has been moving forward since last August to, to move forward with this project. Uh, my, also, my concern is when, when we lay these kind of last minute um, decisions down on our volunteers, it's going to discourage a volunteer. We're not supposed to have discussion. Right now, we're talking about what we want to bring it forward, and that council has to vote for it. Uh, okay. Or, uh, I was just responding to yes. Council Rowland's so, comments as to why. Do we have a motion? All right. I can, do we just put it to a vote? Council, would you like to re uh, address this issue? All those in favor? So, oh, Mayor Foxton, favor. Mayor Foxton, I would say if you're putting forward a formal motion, we do need a mover and a seconder before calling the vote. If you're looking okay. at putting forward a formal motion. Kitsio McKinney. Mayor, there's actually two separate processes. If you wish to debate this issue, it could be in one of two manners. One, Councillor Austin would identify that he wishes a notice of motion, which would then appear as a business item on the next regular council agenda in March. At that point in time, there would be a vote of council on the notice of motion to reopen the discussion on the 10-year capital forecast, which would open the window to have the discussion on anything within the 10-year capital forecast, including that's path one. That does not require a vote today. That just needs a signal from Councillor Oster that he would like this formally placed on the next agenda as a notice of motion, and it would show up on that agenda top sheet for that discussion and debate. The second option is if Council wishes to discuss it tonight, then you would actually have to set aside your procedural bylaw. And that means you would basically then, with the four of five members of Council present, being able to say we're going to set aside the procedural bylaw, which means we waive the notice of motion process, and council then, with four or five members voting in favor, could open up discussion on the 10-year capital forecast tonight, including a discussion on the 10-year capital forecast. Thank you, CEO. Council Austin, being put forth notice of motion. Yes, I would. Okay. Any designated secondary at this time, just to get to it for March 27th. That's right. So the clerk would now record that at tonight's meeting, there was a notice of motion requested by Councillor Oster to appear on the next regular council agenda without a discussion on the 10-year capital forecast for the period of 2023 to 2032 would be open for discussion. Thank you. Okay. Which would include, which would include the pump truck. Okay, so there's a motion that's done. No more further discussion on this. No no more so, so, so then does that still have to be voted by council as to where whether we can do that or not? Yes, that's correct. At the March meeting, council would actually have, they would now have the notice of motion. So they've been now advised okay. that this issue is coming before them. Okay. And four or five members of council would have to agree to that notice of motion. At and the it, March 27th. At the March 27th. Okay. And if they and if they do, then we can have the discussion. Thank you. I need to clarify, notice of motion is to reopen and revisit, so to reopen the procedural line, to allow us, not that procedural line, to reopen discussion in regards to the tenure capital funds, right? So um, someone will draw that information out for him so he can. Yeah, so basically I, I try to put some words in context and if, and if Councillor Oster is agreeable with what I just indicated, the clerk will prepare that and it will show on the agenda talk sheet at the March 27th meeting under the notice of motion portion of the of the circulated agenda. Thank you. So um, now can I go I'm going to go forward with the uh, motion to accept the correspondence. Um Alita, you don't have to read it all. <laughs> okay. Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rollerman that the following be received for the purposes of information all the items listed from 11.1.1 to 11.1.2. 11 11.1.1 .1 .1 to 11.1.10. <laughs> yes, point 10. I was looking at 10 and I said two. 
My, my apologies. 11.1. <laughs> That's scary, thank you. Next, we have the um, advisory committee. Can I have that motion, please, Councillor Tilly? Absolutely. Uh, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Osner, that Council receive the purposes of information the following item North Dumfries Program Advisory Committee meeting, meeting minutes dated February 10th, 2023. All those in favor? That's Kerry, thank you. And Councillor Willen, the next one, please. Move myself by Councillor Wilms that Council receive the purpose of information of the following item Grand River Accessibility by the Committee, minutes dated December 15, 2023. All those in favor? Gary, thank you. Okay. Uh, mayors and councillors, uh, Councillor Tilly, you wanted to report something regarding opportunity to expand music in the park beyond Centennial Park to alternative venues. Go ahead, well, that, Tilly. That, uh, that was fantastic that that was in there. I actually thought that was something that was being reported to myself. I don't, I don't, didn't create a report or have a report for that. So uh, maybe uh, CAO, CAO McNeely can uh, fill me in on that one. I'm not too sure what's going on there. Uh, so Madam Mayor, Councillor Tilly had a discussion with me three weeks ago or so about whether or not it was possible to look at alternative mm -hmm. venues elsewhere across the township to host the music in the park. Uh, typically, uh, I'll rephrase that. Last year was our first year of running 16 or 17 particular consecutive weeks of uh, uh, musicians um, occurring at Centennial Park, generally from uh, June through to uh, first Wednesday past Labor Day weekend. Um, this sort of is an outshoot uh, the last decade or so. Uh, the Air Paris Band has hosted four uh, performances uh, at Centennial Park on Wednesday nights uh, through the summer month. And coming out of COVID-19 to try and get people reintegrating. Uh, council last year in the budget sponsored some funding and we were able to expand on four concerts hosted by uh, the Air Paris Band to 16 or 17 consecutive weeks having a variety of different performances. We maintain the Wednesday time slot um, for that June through early September time period, building on this, the history of Centennial Park and the Air Paris Band. We did this for two large reasons. One was to re-engage people with, I'll use the word, cheap entertainment, um, in that there was no fees charged for entry, um, to get people back into a social environment, uh, obviously in an outdoor setting. And the other benefit that we were hoping to realize was additional foot traffic in the downtown core, and perhaps people as part of the attendance at the concerts would, would frequent some of the stores or restaurants in the downtown and uh, grow those synergies um, and opportunities. So uh, this year, uh, we notified council that we had started to go out uh, and, and walking up uh, some musical performances. Once again, generally that same time period as in 2022. And the question was asked, can we look at other venues? Does it have to be uh, in Centennial Park? So um, we allotted funding for each board. Is that not correct? So the councils could choose how to use funding, certain funds. So Madam Mayor, um, in boards uh, three and four, it is set aside to be used Clyde, Branchton, uh, Brown Subdivision, Roseville uh, for the purposes of undefined community programming. Um, and it was to be done in liaison with the board counselors in works three and four in terms of what would they be looking at in terms of neighborhood or community-wide uh, events or support for community-wide events by uh, those formal council. Uh, Christina, how much was that set aside? $500. Uh, 
I don't avoid it. Go ahead, stop. Go ahead. Sorry. Tom. So let, let me, uh, I guess, give uh, I a little bit more additional information that uh, C.A. McNeely uh, probably didn't exclude, but uh, just to kind of add a little bit more color. Uh, through the Facebook group here in Branch, and we had a question asked what park, uh, which park the music in the park was going to be at. And so my question was asked, uh, which one? And then my second question was, is it possible to have it at different parks if it's not going to just it, just the other one? Uh, in regards to the reasoning and everything like that, because this is my first term and I don't live in air, I wasn't aware of the music in the park. So it was trying to get some background information. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, I'd be welcome to do something and and create something that happened in branch that's going to bring people together and do that uh, but not not try to change what was already happening I it was more of understanding exactly what it was uh, not trying to say that I wouldn't be interested in but uh, again I like to pull the in residents and the individuals uh, in uh, Branchton and surrounding area in, in specifically if in, if that's going to be what it's going to be for so that it's going to be something that they'd want to do to, if they had the budget because I, I I think there's lots of options and I think other people already have some plans what it will look like uh, that's kind of, there's kind of a social committee uh, set up for the the branch and area uh, I know that they'd be interested in, in having a piece of that uh, discussion and uh, feedback on that uh, in regards to what the possibility is sounds fantastic and now I, I found some more information uh, about what is potentially able to happen with like our, our the, the band and what happens uh, through uh, North Dumfries and, and how we um, team up with uh, different aspects of that. I don't want to retract it, but it was more of an information asking at the time that seems to have been made into a presentation that I, I am not prepared for, uh, but looking for more additional information. And, and I welcome uh, CAO McNeely's a different information. Uh, not that we don't want it, but at this point, like I said, we we'd like to to do go over our options before we we use that budget of five hundred dollars per uh, park or, or area to uh, to do that. Thank you. So what I'm going to leave you with uh, discussing it with uh, Karen Winters and uh, then working with Christina and see if we can come up with something. And the same with you, with Lita. Um, so we'll leave it in your hands, Bruce, and staff will come back with the report once they discuss with you guys. So Excellent. is that enough? Enough? Okay, thank Perfect. you. Thank you. Next up is um, the report uh, regarding the town hall meetings. Uh, do you want to touch base with that again before anything else? So that I'm here, Councilor Williams and I had a brief discussion about town halls. And if you remember going back, it was our meeting in December, uh, when council decided we were not going to have advisory committees at least for immediate time period. We talked about the need then to elevate uh, corporate level, um, our need to interact with the community, make sure that we were resonating with key messages, but more importantly, we're also getting uh, comments and touch points uh, with our residents. So we've made some efforts on some specific uh, singular items in terms of having scoped neighborhood information meetings. Councillor Wilms wanted a better understanding about the town hall meetings. You know, we did not do them in the past term of council, the uh, council term of 2018 to 2022, but we did talk at high level about predecessor councils and specific that program in 2014 to 2018. Um, so uh, the clerk, as part of uh, background to your agenda package, sort of gave an overview of options. Uh, and what we wanted to better clarify at a staff level was what was the expectations uh, related to staff resources to support the town hall meetings. So during the term of 2014, 2018, they were actually fairly structured meetings. And the objective was to have a town hall at least once in a calendar year in each of the four wards. Wards one and two, and a couple of kids came together one blended meeting. Um, Certainly in Ward 3 and 4, they were standalone sessions. We had a formal agenda. There was 
whatever those talking points on, in some cases, there were presentations, including once a uh, one once I would go on an outside speaker and talk to a topical area. Um, and there were actually minutes taken of those meetings and they formed part of reporting back to CATS. Okay. The township undertook advertising associated with those meetings to uh, spread the word that there's a town hall meeting at a certain location on a certain day. Uh, staff were present at those town hall meetings. And in some cases, either made presentations and or general questions that might have come from the floor, uh, responding mm -hmm. to some questions if uh, so directed by a member of the council that was hosting the meeting. That's a fairly structured uh, role, and uh, staff was heavily involved in the convening of those town halls. Another manner, which was sort of outlined in the agenda, uh, package was, you know, is it more organic, <laughs> where it's more formal, and it's just a way of coming together with a neighborhood and or the ward, um, and just, there is no structured agenda. It's maybe questions and answers from the floor, information is provided as best we can at that point in time, and obviously if there's a topical area that requires further research or follow-up, then that would occur and some means or fashion we would get that information back out, uh, whether it be later that week or in the weeks to follow arising from the town hall. So I think uh, Councillor Wilms um, wants to get into her ward. Uh, it's a very diverse ward in terms of areas of interest and focus, but before she moved in that direction, she sort of wanted some understanding of context as to how does council plural members see the role of the town hall meetings and that would take carriage based on that, that broader discussion. Is that a fair representation, Councillor Wilms? Yes, it is, McNeely. And um any any thoughts on this would be would be greatly appreciated. I was thinking of something or initially something more organic that I would do kind of or surrounding just basically on the settlements or the big area like that um, and, and just talk about things that matter to those particular neighborhoods and find out more what they like and, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, I'm, I'd be interested to hear what other councillors think about this. So I mean, if I could just add one more comment. These are beyond what we would still do at a neighborhood level. So for example, in Roseville, we've had the issue about uh, concerns of speeding or cut free traffic during certain portions of the business day on Paul Avenue. Those would still occur because they're very, very scoped. Yes. Um, and you're dealing with a very defined footprint in terms of who's impacted and it's a singular issue. <laughs> Those would still occur uh, in concert with the ward counselor. Um, and in some cases, those would return in terms of formal reports to township council, especially if there's an action item that might arise from it. These town halls are more broader focused, uh, but as Councilor Wilms has indicated, it might be on a settlement wide basis or a war uh, scale basis, depending on you know, sort of the content and direction. Thank you. Councilor uh, Tilly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, in, in regards to some of the feedback I've heard and even attending um, the town hall prior to being in council, uh, I, one of the, the opinions that I've heard or, or several opinions I've heard is that in, in this where we were to attend, like again, speaking as an attendee versus council um, back at that point, it was going and basically there's a presentation from council to the area and it was an opportunity to hear uh, the the mayor and council speak to uh, the the area residents, and the feedback I got back from that, and even in, in, in my own opinion, actually, it I found it to be difficult because you would only hear the things, but you didn't get a chance. And so the feedback I got was that people were really interested in, in those environments to give their own feedback, to have an opportunity to speak into it. And I noticed that seemed to be one of the options that uh, that, that was in the report, or and and. That's, I'm sure, what uh, I, I could see as something valid, especially for 
Ward 4, where we do have, again, the same thing as the Ward 3 situation where we, where we are spread out so apart and everybody has different opinions on the different areas that they're in. Uh, I, I do plan on doing something. I don't know ex exactly how the official look of that would be. And I think that's what Councillor Wilms is saying is, is now we need to do this. We know we need to meet with everybody. Uh, is there, what is the protocol in doing it? And does it need to have procedure approved by council for us to start meeting on these bigger scale and the support of the staff? I mean, that looks fantastic to have something documented, but I'm sure it always comes at something that needs more organization and timing. Myself personally, uh, looking at the options, I also noticed that uh, uh, a scheduled yearly or bi-yearly or whatever the, the schedule would be doesn't always work when there's different issues that pop up, pop up but they do do set a date. Uh, so I'm, I'm open as well, same as Councillor Wilms, to reviewing and seeing, um, but leaning towards more of the open opportunity to say, okay, in a month's time, we'd like to have a townhouse, a town hall meeting, sorry, um, for Clyde or for Branchton in this location and we'd like to have it and we'd like to make an announcement or do whatever means we can to share that information with the residents. Uh, now, how do we do that? And, and that's kind of what I'm looking for knowing too, because I've started this slow individual meetings or even trying to collectively meet with people. And thankfully I have the Facebook groups that help me do that. But I know um, Councilor Wilms is having that issue that she doesn't have that connection yet in, in some of those areas. So uh, I think I've said a lot about that, but that's my opinion. And, and I think that's great. And I really appreciated the detail in the report because that's exactly what I needed to hear as well. So thank you for that. Um, I've always liked the town halls um, and I like what you're saying. Uh, I think you do have to figure out some sort of plan on how it should be housed, so how would it be run, where it would be run, what's the cost if we have to rent a facility or do we have to do it facility? Um, when we ran them, we also had to watch for weather. So in order to inform we had to make sure that it was not necessarily the wet times of uh, April, early May, or the freezing cold times of January, February. Um, so late fall, we found good. Late spring was good because you had gotten into uh, a lot of sports with people going away. So it was the time that most people were available. And that would be easy to get to. Um, if you do have them, I'd like to attend with your permission, of course. Uh, let's see how many, maybe, maybe we could scope out, maybe we need to scope out a plan. How would you do it? What's the process? Where you would have it? Um, and you would be the host because it would be your ward. And, and that goes for wards one and two as well, should they be interested. Uh, so let's start to look at it. Let's take a go, scope it out and see what we Let's create that sort of general business plan of, of how it's going to happen and see what we can come up with. Is that fair to you, Lord Neal? So, Madam Mayor, if council is inclined, um, we could prepare a report, uh, basically a reshape of what we shared as a background or uh, your agenda document uh, tonight. Uh, we could reshape that and uh, bring it back for the March 13th uh, council committee roll meeting and council then with some comfort can say this is the option we want and it's there in black and white and we would move forward council Wells. council Wells. Yeah. Council Wells. yeah um so I appreciate that a thought um we could also do like a trial run I know I've been uh speaking with some some folks at in at Barry's Lake and um I, I met with with the folks at the monastery today um mayor foxton and they were like oh you can hold host at our house <laughs> so there is um and that would actually be a really great venue in one sense because it's right there um and um it, it anyway so it, and i know there's a lot of plans going on there around how to preserve berries lake and and the trails they want to set up and and things like that so um, which would be great to get to know and, and things. So, yeah, um, I don't know if we want to consider that like a trial run or or something like that. Yeah, Councilor Austin and Councilor Olmec. Yeah, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> CL McNeely, with this report, could, could you possibly add in uh, 
Like I like the idea. I, I go back to when um, Councillor Ritchie was uh, uh, in Ward Four, Councillor for Ward Four, um, and he had his town hall meeting. And uh, Councillor Olman and I both, and, and Councillor Taylor, wanted to support that and and show Ward Four that we're we're genuinely concerned about them as well. However, when you read all that stuff about you know. Uh, forum and and so that kind of changes how we used to do it because we were all there at Council Ritchie's Council Roland and I had our meeting together and the mayor was there and that constituted forum as well. So is there a way like like if we're simply coming in attendance how does how is that against the, the municipal code? So Madam Mayor through to Councillor Oster. What we did to protect the corporation during the 2000, 2015 to 2018, can't speak to 2014, but um, that's one of the reasons why we actually had a published agenda as well as minutes. Um, and we advertised it broadly, knowing that there could potentially be three or four members of council. What we made sure was there were no decisions made but we publicly reported that council was coming together to hear whatever in a certain location at a certain time. Public was invited, but we stuck to an agenda and the minutes. And the minutes came to a later council. But there was no motions taken. There was no decision making. That's how we protected the corporation and the members of council as it related to public reporting, and making sure that there was no questions about why council is coming together at a certain address. Can I respond? I just wanted to say that the region, we go to several things and we automatically say no decisions. We are there to listen and that's it. And, and so we don't do anything. Go ahead, councilors. Just, just a quick finish up. So uh, my perception of town hall meetings is there's no decisions made anyway. You're, you're you're there to listen to the public's concern, to listen to your constituents. My only thing is that it'd be nice to see other councillors. Like I, I want the residents out for three and four to know that I am interested in their concerns as well. Yeah, you know, I'm not going to make any decisions, but I want to hear. I want to understand what the concerns are in each of those wards as well, as well as Ward One, uh, all four wards. I mean, even though we're in our different wards, we're all part of the same team. And we need to understand so we can support each other. Once we understand the concerns in each area, we have a better idea that when decisions do come to council, uh, we can make a better educated decision on on what the topics of concern are. See you on the Thank you, Councilor Robin. So I think you and I are saying the same thing. Yeah. But by purposely getting out in front and publishing information, we were stating the obvious. But then we were also making it quite clear so that anybody coming to the meeting or anybody not going to the meeting but wanting to know what was going on have access to that information and understood the terms and conditions on which council is coming together to better understand at a granular level, I'll call them unique issues that were represented on a certain portion of the township. And then, yeah, in the fullness of time, it may translate into future reports or there might be something coming forward to council and you have some background context as part of that, that more structured session in a formal council setting at a later date and time. Great, thank you. Council Bowman. Madam Mayor, so I, I think I'm gonna echo what the CEO just said, but I think that the more, more successful town hall meetings were the ones where we had a single issue. You know, like when we had the, the parking, meetings up on hilltop to discuss parking and discuss speeding up there. Um, when we had just sort of a, a loosey-goosey sort of agenda, then we ended up talking about the Pure Cats. So I, I think it's more successful if we say, let's, let's have a meeting, let's talk about the pump track, let's talk about something that's going on in the neighborhood. Then people want to come out and they want to talk about it. But just to have a, a general sort of information meeting, it quickly devolves into something that's not really very effective. Um, yeah, I see your point. And see, you know, only stated that those other meetings will naturally happen. Once so we have agendas, we're going to happen regardless. Regardless. I see what Council, I'm a nice Council Rose. Go ahead, Council Rose. Yeah, so 
I, I do like the idea of having something more structured, but I also think we need to make sure that we leave room for things that um, just for general feedback from the neighborhood itself. Like this is an opportunity to meet with people. They're out. They might be interested in the pump tracks, but they might also have a bee in their bonnet about something else. And they should be have a chance then to also reach out to us and have a general discussion about whatever um, other things that are on their minds or, or in their neighborhoods that they'd like to discuss. So um, I'm going to leave it with staff to come up with even possibly two different scenarios. One is a more structured one, and one is a more informal one, and uh, see what we can come up with. So, Madam Mayor, we'll try to pull something together for the March 13th. Thank you very much. Okay. And, um, was that it? Was that? Are we on to the bylaws? We are on to the bylaws, please. <laughs> Councilor Austin. Move we'll on myself, set by Councilor Wells, that the following bylaw be taken as read on first and second time, bylaw number. 33623 being a bylaw to further amend general zoning bylaw 6899-83 to facilitate the redevelopment of 197 to 211 of the street, lot one and part of lot two, registered plan 550 for a future condominium development with 41 townhouse dwelling units. All those in favor. That's carried, thank you. Please, Moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Rolleman, that the following bylaw be taken as read a third time and finally passed. Bylaw number 3386 23, being a bylaw to further amend general zoning bylaw 689 83 to facilitate the redevelopment of 197 211 Summerlin Street, lot one and part one. Oh, lot two, registered plan 550 for a future condominium development with 41 townhouse dwelling units. Thank you. All those in favor. That's scary. Thank you. A confirmatory bylaw, please. Councilor Tilly. Sorry, just confirming that is this is uh, 3392 23. Yes, of course. Okay, thank you. Right. Um, moved by myself, seconded by Councillor Wilms, that bylaw number 3392 23 be a bylaw to confirm the proceedings on Council on February 27th, 2023, be read a first, second, third time, and finally passed, signed and sealed by the mayor and clerk. All those in favor? That's carried. Thank you. Adjournment, Councilor Roman, please. Move by myself and by Councilor Tilly that whereas business before this council meeting has been completed at 8 22 p.m. and keep resolved, we adjourn to meet again on Tuesday, February 28, 2023, at 7 p.m. for public planning meeting. All those in favor? That's, that's great. Thank you. And now we have comments from members of council. Anything else people want to say? See, now they think of the